Hello, I'm Eliezer Yudkowsky, Research Fellow of the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, and with me today is Robert Green, um, who, with the rapper 50 Cent, is the author of The 50th Law, so-called because it's a sequel to his previous book, The 48 Laws of Power, and The 50th Law is Fear Nothing. So, Robert Greene thinks that we are all too afraid, and would you like to tell us a bit about why you feel we're all too afraid? Well, um, fear can have some function in life. Um, Animals feel fear when there's a a threat or a danger in their environment, and it has a chemical, uh, their bodies have a chemical response that prepares them for fight or flight, and we humans have the same thing. And so obviously if we felt no fear, we would walk right in front of a tiger and be eaten or fall off a cliff or whatever. So fear has certain functions. It also had a, a primitive function in, in feeling a tremendous amount of fear. It inspired us to learn things about the environment that we could benefit from. But I maintain that what has happened um, over the course of thousands of years of civilization is that fear is something that lives inside of us. It's no longer that momentary thing that we feel in the moment. It's some, it becomes this kind of latent anxiety that sits inside of us. And we're not aware of it happening. We have all of these, these tremendous fears of being alone or facing adversity or death itself. And um, because of that, it sort of transforms how we look at the world. It becomes the lens through which we see things. And um, when you're afraid, you exaggerate certain, certain risks in the environment. It changes how you perceive things, and then you act upon that in very deleterious ways. So to me, fear at this point, at this uh, level of civilization where we're living at in 2009, is very, very debilitating. And this book is looking at how you confront these various fears and how you move past them. So this book is with the um, rapper 50 Cent, who, um, who, whose life forms a sort of uh, illustration of many of the points inside the book. He survived uh, getting a number of bullets in him right before his uh, first record was supposed to come out, and then he got dropped by the record company. And nonetheless, he survived and kept going through that, through his horrific childhood, through a number of other uh, adversities. Um, and from this we and from this we learn: don't be afraid, keep going, you'll make it. Now, the obvious uh, first question that that springs to my mind, anyway, as a statistically inclined person, is: you're picking someone who was extremely successful mm-hmm. by fearing nothing. Yes. But maybe that's what we call in the business a survivorship bias. Maybe there's hundreds of thousands of um, sort of young, poor black kids out there who try to fear nothing, and they actually do get fatally shot rather than just non-fatally shot. Well, yes. So may- maybe we're, um, we're just looking at one particular outcome here. How do we know that on average we're too afraid rather than not afraid enough? Well, first I would want to know what you mean by too afraid um, and what the value would be of being more afraid, I guess is that what, is that what you were saying. But uh, what I would say first is... My definition of fearlessness, which I'm attributing to 50, and then I'm looking at other people in history that I think exemplify this, is not the traditional idea of fearlessness. It's not about being bold and aggressive without thought. It's To me, fear is an emotion that colors the way we look at the world. And fearlessness is the ability to control that emotion, so it's more a kind of mental stability. So, for instance... 50 grew up as a hustler on the streets. And 99% of hustlers don't get very far. They're either dead by the age of 25, they end up in prison, they're burnt out by the age of 30. <clears throat> and they can be quite fearless when it comes to guns and violence and dealing drugs, but their limitation is they, they're too afraid to leave the hustling racket. They're too afraid to leave the hood, to leave Southside Queens where he grew up. The fearlessness that we're talking about made it so that 50 was not afraid of getting out of the hustling racket, which is a very bold maneuver mentally on his part because he basically left a world behind 
where he was making a, a fair amount of money and entering into rap, music, business, whatever you want to call it, a world where he had no knowledge of it. It was a tremendous risk and took a lot of courage, and it's what sprang him forward to where he is today. So I first have to clarify that it's not fearlessness of guns or violence. It's more a mental ability to overcome adversity and also to deal with change and not be a prisoner of your circumstances. And I, I'm always somebody who does look at the exceptions, so I probably am violating a lot of the things that you're talking about. You know, I look at Napoleon Bonaparte for lessons on brilliant strategy, whereas, you know, perhaps I could be looking at a lot of mediocre generals and finding out rules from them, which is a valid criticism, but nonetheless, I tend to look at these exceptions. So, um, it says on the back of the book, uh, fear nothing, yep. but perhaps, you know, the more technical description of that would be, don't be afraid of leaving whatever comfortable hell you've gotten yourself into, or something along those lines. Yes, I suppose, because maybe, but that would have been very long to print on the back of the cover and probably wouldn't have looked very good. <laughs> so we had to simplify Oh, come on, with, with smaller print, you could have easily gotten like three paragraphs and a number of logical clauses into there. Well, we, we also translated I don't, I don't, it into... I don't see why from a marketing perspective you wouldn't want to do that. Well, we, we also translated it into Latin, nihil temendum est, and what you just said, I had no idea how I would have translated that into Latin. But I agree with, what, I agree with your idea, and that's, that is certainly more accurate. Okay, so another theme running through the whole book is the theme of power. Yeah. For example, you say that you should learn to see adversity as an opportunity for power. Mm -hmm. Now, most books would sort of complete that thought in the obvious way and say, see adversity as an opportunity for happiness or try to find a silver lining in adversity or something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas you just say, see adversity as an opportunity for power. Um, the theme runs through the whole book, that the reason why you want to be willing to leave your comfortable world is to build a world in which you control your own life rather than others uh, controlling you. Yes. So is that something that we can all do? I mean, if everyone in civilization ends up with control of their own lives, does civilization go on working? Or is it only the few, the, the people? Um, can, can our economy still run? outside the context of these corporations in which all but a very few people are at the mercy of the bosses above them. Uh, is, is, is power something that we can all have, or is it only for the chosen few? Well, oh, wow, that's a long, complicated one there. First of all, I, I would say that having that degree of power and that control, to me, translates into happiness, because I feel, for me at least, there's nothing more miserable than the sensation that I have no control over my future, over the people around me. So I kind of equate the two. Now, on the other, on the other part of the question, um, I, there's, there are various ways to look at it. Um, to me, going on the framework of the 48 Laws of Power, I have this theory that um, centuries ago, millennia ago, power was something that was concentrated in extremely a small number of hands, a pharaoh, a king, his court, a few people. And slowly as we've moved through history, it's become more and more divided and splintered until we've reached our extreme democratic times where people in India now feel like they want some power and they want some control. And they're reading my books or reading other self-help books or whatever. An unprecedented moment in history. And so most people now equate their their happiness with feeling like they have a degree of control. Um, and a hundred years ago, this wouldn't be the, the reality. On the other hand, of course, not everybody is capable of change, of reading a book or reflecting on themselves and saying, I need to alter my behavior in this way. And I don't know. I don't know the answer. I don't know what percentage of people are capable of doing that. And then, of course, I can't answer the question, if everybody did it, what kind of world would we live in? It probably would be problematic if everybody was struggling for control and successful at it and nobody was willing to work for other people and everyone was pushing their own agenda. It, it probably would make civilization impossible, but I don't think 
that we're at risk of that happening because a lot of people um, are essentially, many people are content with what they have or are passive. They, they want power, but they're not willing to go after it. And so I'm not sure. I mean, there was a statistic that I always caught my attention that in, in war, um, a general said that 5% of his troops were basically had the quality to become a leader. Um, and so other people have tried to take that 5% and say that, uh, generalize that to society as a whole. I'm not necessarily willing to say that. So I'm not really answering your question because I'm not sure if I'm capable of answering it. Well, that's certainly fair enough. I mean, it's certainly a lot easier to ask questions than answer them. Mm. Um, I would like to uh, go ahead and do exactly what I accuse you of doing yeah. and uh, offer a uh, offer a quote from a single historical figure. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, Abd Er Rahman III of Spain in 960 A.D. Okay. I have now reigned about 50 years in victory or peace, beloved by my subjects, dreaded by my enemies, and respected by my allies. Riches and honors, power and pleasure have waited on my call, nor does any earthly blessing appear to have been wanting to my felicity. In this situation, I have diligently numbered the days of pure and genuine happiness which have fallen to my lot. They amount to 14. <laughs> now, and of course, one can naturally reply that this is just the person who we quote because he said the counterintuitive thing, yeah. and maybe there were any number of other kings in history who had all the power and were actually pretty happy. So, you know, we don't know that this is the average case over here. Right. But if it came down to a choice between power and happiness, which would you say is more important? Well, it's always a personal choice. I'm not telling people uh, to make the choice based on what I believe. But for me, I would say uh, I would say power, um, because happiness is something to me that's fleeting. Uh, happiness has a background, which is usually pain, difficulty, adversity, suffering. There's no such thing to me as um, unremitting happiness 365 days a year. It has to come from work, from effort, from struggle, maybe from some suffering, and having various triumphs and victories in, in various battles in life. And so I equate being happy with overcoming various things in life, obstacles, overcoming yourself, and there's a constant pattern of battle, overcoming it, and then leading to power and happiness. So I equate the two. Your quote there would belie what I'm saying, um, and there's certainly people throughout history who've had power. Who've well, been not, not at all. You could, you could just say that clearly this king had too felicitous a reign, and he didn't have enough problems to make him happy. Yes, thank you. That's, that's, that's the perfect response <laughs> I should have said several minutes ago. Yes. Um, you know, I mean, I've, I've dealt with, um, since the books, with a lot of powerful people, CEOs, etc., and a lot of them are miserable. Um, they become governed uh, by certain needs that no longer are rational. And um, they're not enjoying their power. They're not playful with it. They're afraid of losing what they have, and I'm saying in the 50th law, and what I admire about 50 and other people, is you have to have the feeling that you're not afraid to lose what you have. You have to have a little bit of craziness in which you're willing to go a little further, and if you lose, so what, you'll, you'll recover. A lot of these people that I know that I think are unhappy is they're holding desperately on to what they have. They're conservative, and their power has brought them fear and paranoia, so that can definitely happen. So it sounds like, in a sense, the, I mean, I probably want to probe a bit deeper into power, but um, a lot of what you, um, you use the word fear to talk about sounds like you're talking about change or novelty. Yes. As, as that that's the essence of what you're getting at with fear. You talk about these executives who have power, and maybe we should probe a bit into power and find that by talking about power, you're, you're really talking about something else like, the ability to overcome challenges or 
um, sort of gr uh, growth and capability or something like that? Because you're talking about, on the one hand, you, you say in your book, you know, achieve power to achieve happiness. And then you say, well, look at these executives who um, have a lot of what we would ordinarily think of as static power mm -hmm. or the capacity to act, and mm -hmm. yet they don't actually seem to do that much acting. They're still sort of stuck in a very small repeating pattern, as it were. Yes, and I would define them as people that have power now, but it's in flux, and I don't know how long it would last. Um, I'm more uh, of a student of Machiavelli, who claims that power must always be justifying itself. It must always be working as if there's necessity to get more and more. He's, he talks about the new prince or having to constantly acquire, and the worst thing that can happen is the sense of complacency, smugness, I have what I have, I'm going to hold on to it. For him, it's a great sin, and I, I, I agree with that. So that's sort of my so, translation of power. It's something very dynamic. So if I can go ahead and uh, interject a personal question over here. Please. Um, one of the aspects I liked about um, the 48 Laws of Power especially was the way you managed to illustrate every single law using a historical anecdote. Where do you get all those anecdotes from? I mean, did you actually collect these yourself? Was there a year-long research phase after you came up with the 48 laws where you went through entire history sections of the library looking for an anecdote that illustrated each one? How did you do that? Well, I have a method, um, and uh, it's something I've evolved over the years because I've done a lot of research. Um, I've accumulated thousands of books and materials, but when I do the actual book, itself, um, I, I kind of work night and day, and I get a lot of, I'm like a detective, I'm looking for that perfect story, I have in my head an idea of something great, of some s s juicy tidbit about a, a man who brings his best friend into the court and sort of um, has him as the future successor, and then he eventually turns against the, the king and kills him, and then I, I find it, I'm going to find it somehow. Um, and so I'm just persistent. I know libraries really well. I've gotten good at doing research on the Internet. And it's mostly a function of how much time you're willing to put into it. If you're willing to go through 400 books, you'll find what you need, especially if you kind of know how to find good books. So, you know, it doesn't... So, so it actually is as difficult as it looks is what I'm hearing here. There's, yes. there's no magic trick to it. There's no magic trick. I have some shortcuts and things that have, and I've tried to hire people to do it for me, and they don't quite get it because there are things that are in my head, things I've learned over the years. But mostly, it's slogging, legwork. It's you know, endless like marches through the fields, um, like a foot soldier, and um, it's not. It doesn't lead to a very you know much of a personal life for the time that I'm doing that. Well, that wasn't the answer I was hoping to hear, but it's uh, mm. certainly a, a useful thing to know. <laughs> but it's, it has its pleasures and its excitement. It's like Sherlock Holmes, I'm on the trail of something, and if it takes me 40 books to find that one idea, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go at it and read all 40 books. So let me just take a, a quick note. Uh, uh, power. Mm -hmm. um, Again, power is a theme that runs all through the 48 laws of, well, what was the term again? Power, yes, 48 laws of power. <laughs> so it sometimes seems to me that your books are written from an attitude that I might try to describe using the word um, cynical, which you, which you said you don't like, and I'll ask you in a moment to um, sort of pick whatever uh, mm -hmm. word you want to use to describe it, but this general notion of everyone's out for power, um, mm -hmm. get every opportunity for power, don't become too loyal to other people, don't expect other people to be too loyal to you. Mm -hmm. So um, if that's not cynicism, then how would you describe that? Well, it, you, you framed it in a cynical way, uh, so it's hard for me to, to disagree. If, that's where, if that were the actual description of my books, I would have to agree that Robert Greene is quite cynical, but I don't think that that's an accurate depiction of my book. In many instances, uh, I'll, I'll cite the war book, for instance, and I'll cite the 50th law. You're not going to get far in life as a leader of a group if everybody that you're leading is out for themselves, 
And also you yourself aren't going to get very far in life if you're not willing to subordinate yourself to some authority upon times in your life. Perhaps that could be for a long time. And so there is a nature of, in, in war and uh, running a group of people where you need to get cooperation, you need to have a team. Um, and I talk about how you do that strategically. Um, so the, to me, cynical... Here's what I think is cynical. I think it's cynical of a lot of people in the media who say things that they don't believe. I'm actually very sincere. What I think is is cynical is somebody who writes a book like The 48 Laws of Power to Make Money that doesn't believe the things that he writes about, but is doing it for ulterior motive. I I mean, I I can't prove that to you. You'd have to know me. You'd have to come over here and talk to me and talk to my girlfriend. I'm very sincere about it. I believe what I'm writing about. There are chapters that are are tongue-in-cheek, and I think people understand when I write about here's how to start a cult up, that I'm not actually advocating that you go out to form a cult. So a chapter like that, I would agree, is a little bit cynical. But in general... But, but, But why not? I mean, why shouldn't you write a book that was cynically trying to maximize your total revenue by appealing to as many people as possible, even if it says things that you don't believe. What are your actual values, then? What, what stops you from doing that? Because I, I don't... Uh, that's just not me. I, I find um, value in being authentic, in expressing something that I hold very dear. Because if I was wrote the book cynically, if I didn't believe what I was talking about just to make money, I don't think it would have had any effect. The fact that people can feel as they read it that there is somebody in here who's lived a lot of these this stuff, who has a degree of anger or emotion behind it, that it's real. If you're cynical, and a lot of people in the media, on television or whatever, I find them very cynical, and you can see right through it. They're, they're saying things for an effect. And I'm not saying, I mean, I know that my writing, I put things in a slightly exaggerated form for effect, so I'm not totally innocent of that. But in general, I'm believing what I'm writing, and I'm feeling very sincere, and it comes from a real place. And to me, that's my definition that's not cynical at all. So I guess it's, I'm just defining it my own self-serving way. That's probably the, the issue here. Well, it was certainly well, there certainly was a kind of genius in, in writing a book where Um, by never quite making it clear as to whether or not, to what degree the 48 laws of power were tongue-in-cheek, you could simultaneously get the audience of all the people who wanted to take it seriously and all the people who wanted to hear you as criticizing the laws that you were putting forth, as it were. So um, you you got both the good audience and the evil audience in the in the same book, which is certain, which which I actually um, admire from a purely aesthetic point of view. I'm admiring it here from a fairly aesthetic point of view. Okay. Um, but, but even so, I mean, is there any particular law in the 48 Laws of Power that you would drag out and say, um, here I was sort of critiquing this law by presenting it as opposed to saying you should actually yes. do X? Yes, most definitely. That's a, that's a brilliant question. Um, law number seven. I'll, I'll, I, uh, let me see what the title is in front of me so I don't misquote my own self. It's... Uh, get others to do the work for you, but always take the credit. Now, you know, a lot of people get up in arms about that. It's a pretty nasty uh, a law. And essentially, uh, I worked in Hollywood for eight, nine years, and that's pretty much the law that everybody would use on me, and I got very tired of it, where I would do, you know, all of the work, and then somebody else would put their name on it. But then when I looked at the world, I saw this is like how almost everything operates you, you see somebody in public office, and, they're, and they've got a team of 30 people behind them writing the speeches. Do you ever think for one moment that that great eloquent speech that you've been listening to, that you're giving so much credit to, to Barack Obama or whomever, was written by somebody else? But no, of course not. But these are, this is the rules, the political rules that people live by in this world today. You have somebody on the news. Uh, they're not... None of the ideas or the facts that they're coming up with come from themselves. It comes from this team of 30 researchers in dark rooms with no windows, working night and day for not very much money, who are coming up with all this, and they're taking the credit for it. I am not expounding that. I I don't believe that that's how the world should be. I actually loathe the fact that that happens, but it's, it's the reality 
in business today. And so I wanted mostly to write about it, to expose to people who are naive, because I was naive when I had this happen to me, that this is the law of the jungle. This is what's going to happen to you. Be aware of it, so either you're not going to resent it, you'll be able to find a way past it, make it work for you, whatever. So in a case like that, I'm not really advocating you use it. I'm trying to show you a subtle way of this is what's going to happen to you and, and be aware. It's interesting that if you think of power as the exercise of personal capability mm -hmm. or, the, or the exercise of personal strength, then the, the example you gave of something that you wouldn't really advocate um, was precisely a case of relinquishing some of your personal capacity to a team of outsources. Uh, someone else writes, writes your speeches for mm -hmm. you instead of doing it yourself. Mm -hmm. And to the same extent, if you think of the exercises of capacity as, as virtuous, you know, if power is virtuous in some sense, then taking credit for what other people do would indeed be the sort of uh, sin of your system, as it were, because it means that the really powerful people aren't getting the proper credit for it. Yes, um, but then, um, then it gets a little bit murky sometimes. So you take someone like Thomas Edison, who I talk about in that particular chapter, and I also talk about the 50th law, and this was a man who was a genius at getting other people to work for him and do great things for him, one of which is Tesla, but there were many other people. That was his particular genius, and it wasn't so much, I mean, he, he was a pretty devilish character on that level, but on the other hand, Edison was sort of a genius at finding people. He, he would kind of come up with the general idea, there was a lot of energy and impetus coming from him, he had visions of what the future would be like, and then he would go find the scientists to do all the research, and then he would put his name on it. So sometimes it can be a level of activity where you're not just simply passively using the work of others, you're kind of directing it, and then you put your name on it, which is one aspect of the chapter. Um, now I'm forgetting what your original question was. Pardon me. Um, Is, am I answering that? I think you more, you more, you more or less sort of um, answered the question. <laughs> okay. I mean, I myself um, am sort of a truth-directed, figure-out-the-answer-to-the-question type of person. Right. But I understand that there are sort of different ways for people to focus their existence. There are people who are focused on stories. There are people who are focused on passion. There are people who are focused on competition, increasing their strength, increasing their scope, um, competitive people, as, as mm -hmm. it were. Or as, as I, I've written some, some short stories uh, sort of exploring this theme of different ways to look at the world, and competitive conspiracy mm -hmm. is the way it would be described within those stories. So it, um, in, in the sense, I'm sort of trying to fit you into my model of how the competitive conspiracy works, the, the notion of um, the virtue ethics based around power, you might say, mm -hmm. in the same way that rationalists have virtue ethics based around truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... Um, you have actually been reading a bit of my stuff, apparently, mm -hmm. so let me uh, just sort of give you an opportunity to uh, sort of t take the ball yourself and start asking me tough questions if you want to at this point, because we're about halfway okay. through. Okay, well, no, there was one thing that intrigued me. Um, you come upon one blog that you had entry was about dealing with censorship on the, in the online community, uh, where you have somebody who sort of enters this kind of Garden of Eden environment where people are interacting with each other or all sorts of interesting ideas are coming on, and then suddenly there enters this troll, this, this person that's got kind of selfish agenda and kind of starts ruining the environment. And then people who are kind of brought up on the um, egalitarian notion of the Internet find it very hard to, to censor this person, and then the, the worm is inside the garden and they end up destroying everything. Um, and so you were talking about, I think, the need to be able to take control of this world and to not be afraid to censor those people and sort of protect this environment. Am I, am I saying that reasonably correctly? Sure. I, I mean, one of, the, one of the themes there was the idea that academics go to these conferences where, you know, there's these $1,000 entrance fees or you've got to be a professor with a submitted paper to get in, and they have a concept of freedom of speech, mm -hmm. 
Um, so with, without sort of thinking about all the barriers that are there to keep, prevent the janitor from getting up and talking in the middle of the conference. Right. Um, and the analogous sort of thing tends to happen on a lot of online communities mm -hmm. uh, where the problem is that there isn't an effective barrier to uh, exclude the, um, the people that are sort of implicitly, automatically, invisibly excluded by the, the, uh, the academics and their walled gardens. And there are indeed people who can manage to, um, you know, I sort of don't want to say anything against janitors in particular here, but mm -hmm. there are people who can manage to uh, destroy uh, via trolling a, uh, a, a nice Internet garden community, and then you do have to put up walls. And the people in that community mm -hmm. will resist because of an instinct that's built into us, I think. Um, whenever someone tries to... Uh, the, the sort of cry of censorship is driven, I think, by a fear of other people in the community gaining power. Mm -hmm. when, when the trolls come in, the important thing to some members of the community is not to get rid of the troll, it's to prevent anyone else in their community from gaining more power or, 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 have, or, um, or rising in status. And, and so as soon as anyone tries to propose a system of censorship, they cry, censorship, right. as, as it were. But then... What intrigues me here, because we're entering a realm of, of politicking and of 48 laws of power, how do you determine this, these, these standards of censorship, not censorship, but just even standards of behavior? Because the danger that you have is, if your standard is you want kind of polite conversation, which a lot of online communities deteriorate because they end up becoming uniform. Everyone's on the same page, and they're, it's just sort of self-congratulatory. And if one person enters with a different point of view, they're shouted down and kind of crushed. And so, you know, on the one hand, you want to keep a lively debate, and so you have to be tolerant of people who might say occasionally idiotic things. On the other hand, you don't want to be wasting time with someone who's obviously um, trying to, to provoke things. How, how do you establish these standards? Because you're entering the realm of politics here. Well, for me, that's a sort of difficult question because I actually, um, you know, the, so the sort of the real answer is that, that in my own case, I would rely on my own good taste and do it without, um, without much hesitation. Right. I, I mean, in point of fact, I think it's, fairly easy to, um, on, a, on an even a purely perceptual level for, uh, for me at least, to um, pick out people who are presenting good, you know, sort of well-structured, thoughtful arguments that you disagree with and people who are coming in and trying to be trolls. Right. Usually the trolls make it really easy by misspelling their sentences and using poor grammar yes. because these are not rocket scientists we're talking about. Right. Um, I've only ever encountered one troll I can think of who actually had good grammar um, uh, in, in his sentences, mm -hmm. and uh, that 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 person still, you know, um, it, it was pretty clear that that person was uh, trolling for attention, right? Or, or actually, I should just say trolling because I don't know about his motives, can't see inside his head or anything. Right? They're always male, so you know you can eliminate half the populace right That's there. Very true. <laughs> um, and, and and similar sort of pra pragmatic rules. Now the problem is, of course, that. Um, people have different talents in life and it may be that there are people out there who genuinely who are genuinely uncertain they're not just making a great show of questioning themselves in order to sort of convince that you know sort of show off to themselves how humble they are they genuinely can't tell the difference yes or they're genuinely afraid that they can't tell the difference right. between someone coming in as a troll and someone coming in as a, with a thoughtful disagreement um and in, in that case, uh, well, you know, that's sufficiently unlike my own life experience that I'm not even sure what kind of advice I, I could give to these people. I don't know how my brain does the things that it does without my even bothering it to, you know, you know my, my brain acts as a little server. I trans as it were, I, I wish for it to, to see something and it sees it, or sometimes it just sees it without me even bothering to wish. And it's a scary sort of thing because my brain could just decide to stop doing it one day right. and I'd have no remedy except to, you know, gaze off forlornly at this thing my brain used to be able to do and now can't. So if someone genuinely can't tell the difference, you know, mm. can't tell the perceptual difference between a troll and a thoughtful argument, mm. um, can they just cede power to someone else who claims to have that ability? Well, that is going to run into a certain number of problems yes. because if you don't have the taste yourself, how can you tell if they're lying? <laughs> yeah. um, 
in in a case like yeah. that, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm sort of unsure what can be done about it. I mean, the basic ability to discriminate good arguments from bad arguments, mm-hmm. um, you know, is you know sort of one of the core processes of rationality. And aside from trying to teach people at great lengths to, you know, sort of find the still place inside them where what they want to believe doesn't exert so much as so much of an influence as how they evaluate others' arguments, warning them about, you know, sort of confirmation bias, the tendency to look only for confirming sources of information, mm-hmm. warning, warning them about the failure mode in which you know so many errors and biases to accuse other people of that um, you, you can find an objection to anything you don't like. These are all ways of discriminating good arguments from bad arguments, mm-hmm. but um, thoughtful arguments versus trolling, mm-hmm. I th- I, that has always seemed to me to be a matter of, well, it's something that my own brain says at a glance, and so I've never really written yeah. much about how to tell the difference otherwise. Maybe you could have, I, I mean, a, a karma system in an online community where you vote things up or vote things down, mm-hmm. that might solve some of the problem by letting you have troll control mechanisms without any one person seeming to gain power. Right. Um, but even those have their own problems and are subject to their own systemic abuses. So, so I, I, I have suggestions. I have advice. I tell people, you know, are you really incapable of telling the difference or are you just not trusting yourself to wield power? Because if so, you probably have no choice but to wield a bit more power. Right. And I can tell people to use sort of Reddit-like systems for karma and, and see if that helps because that's mm-hmm. a means of censorship that doesn't give censoring power to any one person. It gives the power to the community. Right. Uh, and that's pretty much all I, I can say by way of advice. Okay. Well, I, I mean, I, um, as a person who believes in exercising power, I... I can applaud all of that. Um, I just think, to some degree, there's an art to it. It's not all completely rational. It's a feel that you have that somebody um, is perhaps up to no good or has another agenda, and I think that's totally fine. That's, to me, the art of of being a leader. It's not just all uh, based on concepts that you have, but you also can judge things by people from, from the feel that you get from them. Uh, do you have anything against that? Um, I'd actually say that um, rational to me uh, doesn't mean thoughts you have in words. Okay. Rational right. refers to a sort of structure in a cognitive yes. process. It can be a cognitive process in words. It can be something your eyes do. Mm-hmm. You know, you, looking at your shoelaces to see whether they're tied or untied mm-hmm. may not be a very reflective, deliberative process. Mm-hmm. But by golly, you end up with a pretty accurate picture of whether your shoelaces are tied or not. Okay. So if, if our verbal consciousness had the sort of rationality that our eyes and visual cortex have, mm-hmm. you know, we, we can only dream of, of, of having political perceptions that, were, that are half as rational as our retinas. Okay. So I, I wouldn't call it non something other than rational. I'd call it something other than verbal, this okay. kind of wordless sense that you're talking about. Okay. I applaud all that, and I agree. Um, well, one thing I wanted to get to, um, where I think there's a, a, a disagreement on our part, um, a healthy one, though, is this notion that I was reading about of, of transhumanism. Um, now, I have um, the 10th chapter of the 50th law is all about the fear of death, because I believe that that's the ground of all of our fears, that we're not confronting that. And because we're running away from that, elemental fear, um, all of these other fears are taking root, but they're all kind of growing out of that same seed. And to me, it's a, it's a point of ultimate realism where you can't get past this one barrier that we can argue about so many things, but n- nobody can argue about the f- elemental fact of death. And so a primary thing for being a human being and for overcoming your fears is to, to confront your mortality and find a way of making it something positive, which I try and describe in the book. Now, you have this um, notion, I believe, that you ascribe to called transhumanism, um, which I find I I don't have a problem with. I think it's it's interesting, and I'd like to know more about it. But what I want to know is um, it seems based on a premise that um, it's more on, on faith 
than on something rational, which is that science is leading us to this point, technology is leading us to this point where we're going to someday confront the possibility of immortality, and that will change the game completely for human nature, philosophy. We have to rethink so many uh, aspects of life. No, I mean, is, how, can you, how can you extrapolate from the incredible technological advances that are going on to this notion of immortality without making a leap, uh, an irrational leap of faith that that will happen? Well, first of all, um, you've got to distinguish between real immortality and, you know, just sort of immortality. If you live for 10 billion years and then die, that is not technically immortality. Okay. Immortality does not mean dying after a very long time. Okay. It means just not dying ever. Right. But dying uh, after 10 billion years would put our death far enough out that... Um, on a, as, as it were, if you knew you were going to live that long, then on a day-to-day -day basis now, you, you wouldn't be able to see, foresee to the person who you would be at the moment but, that But I could imagine that thinking. science could transform me into a snail in a thousand years, and that would certainly change a lot of things. But what makes you believe that will happen? Um, well... I'm, I'm trying to sort of... I mean, there's a number of ways you can think about it. One way is just um, it, you, you do indeed extrapolate. There have been changes so far. There will be other changes in the future. Um, there, there's a number of things that could wipe out the whole human species, and in, in that sense, these things would, would never come to pass, which would be a terrible loss. But as long as humans or things with human values keep on ticking, mm -hmm. um, then we can look at the laws of physics and we can get, and we can say, if our models of the laws of physics are correct, um, what should we be able to do with future technologies? Now, living literally forever is not one of those things. Okay because there's, um, the universe is expanding, there's only so much matter available, there's only so much negentropy that we can use to perform computation. So unless the laws of physics are, as we know them are wrong, or unless we can do something that seems even stranger and uh, get, out, get outside the universe as we know it, um, if we take the laws of physics at their face value, then we are not going to be able to continue thinking new thoughts literally for, uh, forever. But, mm -hmm. by the same token, the laws of physics say that the brains that we've got right now are nowhere near the, the top of the line brains that should be physically possible. We have neurons firing a, a couple of hundred times per second tops. Mm -hmm. We have axons transmitting uh, information between neurons at a millionth the speed of light. Um, there doesn't, and, uh, and, of course, neurons uh, get old and die and cannot be backed up, cannot be replaced. Um, and, and these are all, and, and by looking at the laws of physics, it's, um, in terms of physical permissibility, mm -hmm. it, it seems very clear that you can have brains that are faster than human, bigger than human, and last much longer than human. Now, the next question is, will we get there? And again, I think it's just a question of, of having perspective. This world that we live in today, which where if you sort of take, if, if you're watching this near your computer, and you just take around a glance nearby, mm -hmm. then you're going to see some trees out the windows, you're going to, as it were, see air around you, um, and you're going to see yourself and maybe some other people mm -hmm. and a pet, and practically everything else you see is going to be a byproduct of the human mind. Yeah. The world wasn't like that 10,000 years ago. But 10,000 years ago, you saw a completely different world. But what, and what? a million years ago, there weren't, any, there weren't things that we would recognize as modern-day humans. Okay. Things have changed before and will change again. Okay, but what what it seems to be abstracting from is the uh, is the whole element of human nature and and politics. So we're advancing incredibly f speeds uh, technologically, but politically we're extremely primitive. Extremely primitive. We're still a lot of the decisions that our leaders um, are, are based on are are very irrational. Belief systems going back hundreds of years. What you're talking about, the, the human nature isn't going to change. And so, as this could be an, a major impediment, first of all, to this ever happening, 
But even if it does happen, how can you abstract this idea of people living very long from the political realities that someone could use this for extremely dastardly purposes, like, like eugenics, where you, um, or that population, that there'll be incredible unintended consequences of this reality. Uh, in, in Japan, in 1900, they did these, the um, hygienics were improved incredibly by using some things from the West, and the population doubled, and many people believe this is what eventually led in some ways to World War II for their need to expand. How can you take away the whole political implications of this and how politics would also play a role if this ever did come to pass? Would it be a utopia or a dystopia? Well, there's a number of questions there. And first of all, I would say that politics is something that other transhumanist figures obsess about to a much greater deal, much greater degree than I do. Okay. Um, James Hughes at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies is one example of a person, uh, of a transhumanist who would go around chiding me for not paying enough attention to politics. Okay. Um, but to sort of answer your, point, your points in something like the order in which they were raised, you talk about human nature yeah. as if human nature was something true, everlasting, uh, enduring, unalterable, and that's really a very um, sort of nearsighted view of history. A uh, hundred million years ago, uh, there wasn't anything beginning to, to approach modern-day modern mammals to say nothing of uh, human nature. Um, there were probably things going around a hundred million years ago that experienced fear, but it wasn't the kind of fear we have nowadays. And we, you know, we've got all these lovely little uh, pharmaceuticals coming down the line, um, that could alter human nature, not necessarily in pleasant directions. Yeah. I mean, I would be pretty horrified at the thought of feeding Prozac to everyone. But nonetheless, human nature is not unalterable. Uh, we're beginning to get our grubby little hands on it right now. If you want something really scary, think about human nature being determined by the outcome of political battles in the next couple of generations. Now, there's a, now there's, there's a scary thought. I, I uh, tend but, to... But how, um, can you, how can you alter human nature almost in a chemical, not in a chemical, but in a, uh, in a way where you're directing it towards goals that you want, how do you know that these alterings of human nature might, might be negative? Are you, are you talking about enhancing human nature and who, who's deciding what is enhancing it? Well, my own uh, perspective on these things is, comes from the uh, Singularity Institute on Artificial Intelligence Research Project, mm -hmm. uh, which, which was once sarcastically described by the lovely term "brain in a box in a basement," mm -hmm. um, where you you say where you sort of say, "Well, these political problems look really difficult, so I'm going to try to solve a technical problem instead." Right. Because the difference between technical problems and political problems is that technical problems are solvable. So, my own attitude, which is which is not shared by transhumanists in, in general necessarily, yeah. is to take these various political problems that you've pointed out and turn them into technical problems. Right. And one way you can turn them into a technical problem is by building an artificial intelligence right. that's sufficiently smarter than you that it can actually um, go around figuring out an upgrade path for human brains that doesn't drive people slowly crazy or have all sorts of unintended consequences not foreseen to the AI. Um, and but, but a lot of these very difficult problems you're talking about here are ones that I would tend to deal with by saying, the um, you know, sort of this is still a problem even if you hand it to an AI because you have to be able to describe what it is exactly that you want right. the AI to figure out. Um, but, but nonetheless, a lot of these problems are ones where I would basically try to pawn them off on a smarter than human intelligence, bearing only in mind that I have to be able to describe what problem is I'm asking the AI to solve. Well, well here's one thing... Um, one specific element I would talk about, which relates to my books and to the 50th law, dealing with transhumanism, you were saying that some people use death as a kind of positive value, which I'm doing here, and saying that being aware of your death, for instance, can give you the sense of urgency, that things need to be done now and make you appreciate the moment. And you counter that argument by saying, well, why can't we make this the fact of being immort immortal, the beautiful thing, and people will still then come to a point where they feel the need to get things done now anyway, um, somehow. And, okay, I'm sorry, I probably didn't well, say that very well, but... 
you can well and, and even even in specific terms um for example um if you're laying down more and more memories over time your mind probably has to expand to integrate the new memories um you know if your if your IQ is going up at one point per year then you only have a limited amount of time in which any particular sort of regime of challenge is still challenging um you know still lies on on the right borderline between being too easy and too hard so if you're trying to solve a rubik's cube say um that's a interesting you know interesting if you're um just encountering it for the first time and you've got a human level brain but if your brain was 10 times the size of a human then the rubik's cube would be too trivial to be interesting and there'd be other problems that would be interesting instead um but But, so okay. the, the the new improved tragedy of existence okay. can be our inability to explore more than a tiny fraction of the fun you can potentially have at a given level of intelligence before laying down new memories means that your mind has to expand and you've moved on so that will be the new source of the sense of urgency we don't need death for that well uh, okay, but, my, but my argument is that the human nature that i'm talking about which i agree is is in flux it's never the same uh but it to me it evolves very slowly um uh but one thing that i think we i've always felt about human nature that is permeates my books is that and it comes a lot from machiavelli is this notion of necessity that people don't act unless they feel the need to act if they don't feel something pressing in on them if you have 3 months to finish your college paper you're probably going to wait till the last week to finish it but if the professor gives you a deadline of in 2 days you're going to start working on it right then that's to me that's an in that's a law of human nature that i don't think will ever necessarily be eradicated and so if you had a vista of time of 500 years a thousand years 10,000 years it's going to be to me you can't counteract this this element of our nature that says i have so much time why do i need to do it now It's to extrapolate that you'll be able to overcome that to me is once again a leap of faith where it almost is more like a religion uh, a religious belief in something that will transpire what makes you think you will be able to o- overcome this almost ineradicable part of our nature i don't think that college students are driven if, by fear of death to start with i don't think they're thinking about their own future deaths at all um robin hansen um once said um we if we aren't really afraid of death if we were afraid of death we would spend a lot of time thinking about how to avoid death and we would uh, have some success in those thoughts because there are things you can do now nowadays like sign up for a chronic or you know get better uh you know take take a bunch of uh vitamins or whatever well um, i wasn't implying that these students are fearing death i'm just talking about the nature people of, are afraid of, of thinking about of, death you know of necessity and, and si- i'm sorry and and, and uh, people are afraid of thinking about their own deaths and similarly robert edinger once uh, said um you know if people were really scared uh you know really wanted to live they'd be signing up for chronics and droves but actually you know sort of our fear of death is only activated in the immediate presence of a danger that we understand and even then only if we're relatively healthy and active if the individual's health is impaired if the danger is far off if the danger is difficult to understand mm-hmm. then people don't act very afraid of death at all because they can just sort of rationalize it away um right. stockholm syndrome is the is the term that a lot of transhumanists use for people who are trying to turn death into a good thing. If you had a civilization full of people who didn't die and had had never gotten into the habit of dying, um well, let me put you that suppose it this way. Suppose that um people got whacked in the head with a baseball bat once every week right. and there was nothing that they could do to avoid it for thousands of years. Pretty soon philosophers would come up with reasons why being whacked with in the head with the but baseball bat once death, a week but, is actually really good for you. But death and and baseball bats it's that's not a a, a comparable argument. Death is a is a fact of life. It's been all that we've known for for billions of years since life began. I, that can't be compared to a baseball bat. It's yeah yeah it can because the key thing is, you know, people would come up with rationalizations while being hit in the head with the baseball bat was a good thing. but you know if you took a civilization full of people like us and said you know how about if i hit you with the head and the head with the baseball bat every week 
and, and tell them about all the wonderful benefits of being hit on the head, they'd say no. And if you took a civilization full of people who mm. weren't dying and you offered them death as a gift, they'd say no. They'd say, what a tremendously stupid idea. Okay. And, and the fact that, that um, this has been going on for billions of years is, is no excuse. But then it, it's, it, it's, it hasn't been going on for billions of years because it's such a good idea. It's been going on for billions of years because we just didn't have the technology yet well, to deal with. All right. Okay, well, we, we, but, but getting back to the notion of, of necessity and how, about how much that's part of our nature where we don't tend to act until we feel the, the need to act, until we feel time pressing in on us. Uh, the the psycho- psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan would make people come, instead of a 50-minute session of therapy, he would have it be like five or ten minutes, or they never knew how long it would be. And that sense that, that, that this could end at any moment would force them to talk and be more intense and, and really focus on what they needed to get done. When you take away that element for people, they tend to get lazy. And even with all of the technology that we have now, I find that's actually getting worse, that people are even becoming lazier than ever. Um, so how would you be able to combat this, this to me, uh, very elemental part of human nature, that people don't feel any urgency to get something done unless they feel time pressing in on them or some... some but, but, it's, but it's like you say, people are lazy right now. Mm-hmm. They're dying, and they're still lazy. Laziness isn't driven... By this, by this very distant event of death. No, because they're not it's driven by the distance they're between not con- a fifty-minute session and a fifteen-minute session. But they're not confronting their mortality, and that's what I'm saying. When you confront it, that's what makes you urgent, and that makes that's what makes you. They're they're avoiding the thought of death. They're not. They're not. They're trying to run away from it. Well, yes, and if and you know if you if you can't admit that death is a very bad thing that you would never have chosen for yourself if you had a choice. You know, you can you can live with a few. Uh, you can live with the lemons. You don't have to mm-hmm. uh, transform every single lemon into lemonade, especially when it's that awful of a lemon. Right. And especially when you know, for the first time in history, um, people are coming forth and saying, "Sign up for chronics and avoid dying." Okay. You know, you know, once as soon as the options on the table to avoid death, you can no longer take refuge in the apparent inevitability in the notion that you're necessarily better off if you manage to convince yourself that this is a good thing, even though you never would have chosen it if you'd had a choice. Right. Because once there's actually a choice on the table, you now have to confront full force. Do I want to die or not? Should I be look investigating mm-hmm. these technologies? Should humanity be investing in these technologies? Mm-hmm. You know, the, the option's on the table now. Okay. And this 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 um the sense of urgency to me to me this sounds like you know being hit on the head with a baseball bat every week makes us tougher. It teaches us you know to, uh, courage in adversity. Um, and I I just don't think that in, that in real life a sense of urgency comes from these very abstract thoughts about your distant death years in the future. A sense of urgency comes from particular opportunities that mm-hmm. are slipping away in front of you. Mm-hmm. And as long as the future contains opportunities, and those opportunities are linked to particular events in time, and they only last for a limited time, and they keep slipping away, people will go on being motivated by that short-term sense of urgency. Okay. And, as, and even if that weren't true, mm-hmm. human nature is not a fixed constant. I agree. If it's really, truly necessary to you know, give, you know, give people a bit more pep to overcome the fact that their, their death has been moved out to a billion years instead of mm-hmm. 50 years, which is probably just as far away from the perspective of most people, uh, we can give people a bit more pep. I mean, human nature is not a fixed constant. But I, I just, I mean, I, I'm finding this fascinating. I just wonder, if, can that be engineered? Can you engineer something like a sense of urgency? Yeah. Okay. You can engineer anything. Okay. It, when, it, when it comes to minds, um, there's all sorts of possible minds. You know, uh, clearly, the set of things you should engineer is a very, very, very tiny subset of the set of things you can engineer. But in terms of what you can do, mm-hmm. then um, you know, just sort of putting on my cognitive science hat for a second, mm-hmm. the design space is very large, and the answer to most questions, can I do X, is just yes. Okay. I, and I only chose this, I'm, I agree with 95% of what I read on your blog. This is the one area where I've... I felt the most disagreement. So, 
I don't mean to give the wrong impression. That oh, that, 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 that's fine. Um, so, so we got sort of um, theoretically one minute left, and we can yes. go over time, but on, only slightly. So is there any you know, sort of last shots you wanted to take at me? No, no, I was going to leave that one minute open for you to, uh, to dig your claws or aim your cannons at my head. Oh, um, so in that case, I would just say that it seemed uh, the the single most useful piece of advice I got from from uh, this book was always attack before you are ready. I said that to Michael Vosser, president of the Singular Institute. He goes, mm-hmm. "Yep, always attack before you're ready." What do you mean by that? Um, uh, well, well, I, well, you're the one who wrote it. <laughs> I, so. know, but, <laughs> I know. Uh, oh, oh, just that that we tend to prepare and prepare and not get stuff done because we're so busy preparing all the time. Right. That's one, and, you know. and, and and that sort of spirit of it, mm-hmm. you know, that that if you've got something you're afraid of, attack. Don't be afraid to leave your comfortable world. Right, exactly. That's exactly what transhumanism is about. Okay. Don't be afraid to to leave uh-huh. this comfortable world of human existence, which is actually a bit of a hell we're all trapped in. Mm-hmm. This, what are we going to do if we stop dying? Mm-hmm. Isn't this exactly the sort of fear you talk about in your book? Isn't this exactly the sort of fear that keeps hustlers hustling? Because what will I do if I'm not a hustler anymore? Mm-hmm. What will I do if I'm not mortal anymore? What will I do if I live longer, if I'm healthier, well, if I'm smarter, if I, I you know, have some degree of control over m- my own brain function and, and but, so on? This is exactly only, what transhumanism is about. But I, and I find that beautiful, and I, and I would love, lovingly subsume it into my own philosophy here and all of that. Um, the, the only thing I would say is that to me it's not a reality about uh, living these amounts of years. And then in that aspect it becomes more like a dream. And I like to live my life based on reality. In that sense, that's how I consider myself a rationalist. And for my life, as it is now in, in the year 2009, death is, is an imminent reality. It can happen tomorrow. It can happen in 20, 30 years. And so I want to live my life according to a philosophy that ba- is based on real limits, on real pressures, on real circumstances, and not... Con- I don't even... Why should I concern myself with what the world will be like in a thousand years? It seems like an escape to me in a way. Well, if you expect the future to be just like the past calling that realism isn't going to save you from the fact that you're guaranteed to be wrong. So and one of the principles of rationality is that you shouldn't use strategies of choosing beliefs which are guaranteed to be wrong and expecting the future um, well, I'm to, only, you know, I'm only be, referring the that same in terms sort of technological... Of, I'm sorry, I'm only referring sorry? that in terms of death in the time that I'm alive. I'm not referring to it in, in other areas. You understand that? Well, it, yeah. it, as, as long as you buy the basic scientific premise that your brain actually is your mind and mm-hmm. the, the very good neurological guess that your memories are encoded in things like the pattern of synaptic connections, mm-hmm. then if you're worried about death today, mm-hmm. then you can today go to the Alcor oh. Life Extension Foundation okay. or the Chronics Institute and say, when I die, uh-huh. um, pump me full of cryoprotectants and cool down my brain to liquid nitrogen okay. temperatures to preserve the information so that eventually they can go in and repair it. Okay. So there are things that we can do to combat death today, mm-hmm. um, sort of like an ambulance ride to get you to the future where okay. those technologies actually operate. And, and, and not, not to go into that whole debate right now, but the sort of general point with transhumanism is you don't have to believe that these technologies will happen. Mm-hmm. Transhumanism says it would be good if we can do these okay. things. And then the question becomes, which of these things can we do? Mm-hmm. What investments do we make in order to promote these technologies? Transhuman- transhumanism starts as a goal rather than a belief, okay. but it does, it, does, uh, it does require the belief that these things are technologically possible, and that is a question of engineering and physics, and I would say there, okay. as I would be expected to say, that the evidence comes down heavily in favor of transhumanism. Okay. Well, you've clarified that for me. Okay, so it's been a wonderful conversation. (laughs) Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elias. I enjoyed it.